And if it weren't for your book, I'd kill myself. Wow. Wow. I, that's what I said. I said, yeah. wow. Let me ask you, what really makes a good doctor? If you're not happy, how are you supposed to help your patients? Dr. Bergman, how's it going? Shem, call me Shem. Shem? Shem. How did that whole thing get started with the, uh, the pseudonym you use? Well, uh, I was, uh, the book was coming out just as I was in my, starting my psychiatric practice. I'm, I've been in recovery from being a psychiatrist for many years. <laughs> and, uh, and people told me, you know, they were very kind of Freudian in those days. They said, don't tell people your, your name, you know, because they can get you or something or know too much about you. You know, they said, look, it's a sexy book. It's a funny book. It's raucous. It's irreverent. And so I took my, I took a pen name so they wouldn't know who I was. Well, guess what? All of them found out. All of, of them found out, of course. <laughs> And they'd come into the, the session and they'd say, uh, oh, my God, you wrote that book and I read it and it's sexy and it's all, you know, it's all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And they didn't then they'd stop and they'd say, oh, and you should have heard uh, what my boyfriend said. They didn't care. They didn't care. They wanted to talk about themselves, not me. And uh, but I was stuck with it. But I'll tell yeah, you. How, so that followed I, you forever. You know, and I also didn't want to be a writer out in public. I yeah. thought the book would stand for itself. I never did. For two years, I never did a single appearance. And because this was in uh, 78, there was no email or anything. People couldn't find me. And I got I got appearance offers from all over, like uh, medical commencements and all. I, I never responded. And the book took off, you know. And then um, one day through my publisher, I got a, uh, a letter and it said, uh, I'm in a VA hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and if it weren't for your book, I'd kill myself. Wow. Wow. I, that's what I said. I said, yeah. wow. And so I said, look, maybe you can do some good in the world, right? They want to hear from you. Maybe you've got something that can help people. And so um, I started uh, accepting things and I've never stopped. And the thing I talk about all the time is the same thing. It's um, the danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection. Yeah, absolutely. It's a point of view that probably a lot of people have and feelings that a lot of people have. That no one's been brave enough, especially nowadays, to actually put it out into the world. And you did that in the 70s. Yeah, I did it in the 70s. Now, these novels are novels of resistance. I yeah. was, the reason I write is to address injustice. And that's what the House of God was with injustice in, uh, in training. And the thing is, for better or worse, I don't run on fear. I run on guilt. I love that. The very psychiatrist, uh, you know, motive. Uh, well, I don't know, but you know, the the man's fourth best hospital is also now a. Uh, I'm going to get killed for it. I would also, expect nothing less. <laughs> what gets me going as a writer is what I call these "Hey, wait a second" moments, like when you, you know, maybe you pass a guy on the street and he wants a dollar, and you walk past, and then later you say, "Hey, wait a second, he didn't look so bad. Why didn't I do that?" Well, in the house of God, there were so many "Hey, wait a second" moments that I said to myself, hey, somebody's got to tell this story. I guess it's up to me. And that's what happened with Man's Fourth Hospital, too. Yeah. What's amazing is how much from House of God still remains true today. A, yeah. a lot of it is timeless, absolutely timeless, which is... It's incredible, yeah. isn't it? It really is. You know, a lot of this stuff is like, okay, this was clearly, you know, from before. A lot of these things of all, all the social norms have changed. Everything is a little bit more politically correct now and tiptoed around. Right. But the principles and a lot of the stories and, and things like that are so relevant to, I mean, to me and my friends. And obviously most people that I know have read this book and it's yeah. just an incredible connecting, connecting tool. Yeah. You know, Jay, that's, that, that's one of the biggest surprises for me. You know, I was out of medicine. I wasn't doing any medicine mm -hmm. uh, and I was just writing for years. And then I got a call from uh, NYU medical school. And they said, you want to be a professor of medicine and medical humanities? I said, what? Why? <laughs> you know? They said, well, we want you to teach. And I said, what do you want me to teach? They, and they said, the house of God, dummy. We want you to teach the house of God. And Harvard had hated me for the house of God because it's one of their hospitals, you know, the Beth Israel. Yeah. And here was a was an institution that wanted me for the house of God. And so I've been teaching for five years now a uh, seminar, about 25 people, just called the house of God. And it's just going through the book. And you're right. I mean, I don't let the kids, the kids to me now, I don't let the students or interns uh, have their, their screens there. And it's an hour and a half each session. And you can hear a pin drop. You can hear a pin drop. 
it's what you're saying. This somehow this absolutely connects with their experience now. So that's so interesting. You're teaching a class on this. I did yeah. not know a seminar, a, a seminar. seminar. How often do you do this? I do. It's a six session seminar once a week, hour and a half each session. Now, what do you teach specifically? Is it like a medical ethics, uh, a healthcare system? Like what is the, what is the curriculum of this seminar? That's whatever comes up, I teach. You know, I assign chunks in six chunks and we never finish the book actually, but the big things come up. You know, even though there are a lot of things that are strange to them, like the on-call and being so tired. These people are never this tired, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the interns now. What happens is it absolutely hits the core of our fantasies about what should be and what actually is. And that's still true in medicine, but it's a different. What woke me up this time when I got to NYU, when I was back in medicine, the first day I was back there, I was going on rounds, you know, I got so lucky. I had a, such a lucky life, I'm telling you. I always wanted to write a sequel, but I wasn't in Madison anymore. And then like the first week I was there, I was going on rounds. And all of a sudden I saw from the inside what modern medicine is. I saw the absolute miracles. I don't have to go into it. It's, you know, they're there. Amazing things from what I did and that you did. But I had the, one of those, hey, wait a second moments, you know, I said this other stuff is really bad. And somebody's got to show it to people, both medical people and outside patients, too. And I guess that's up to me. As, as uh, the narrator says at the beginning of the book, Roy Bash, he says, I'm called to write this book because it's, I'm looking back at a time when medicine could go one way or the other, either to more humane system, a, a more humane system or toward money and screens, mm -hmm. which is money and money. Yeah. And so that's, that's that got me going three years ago. I said I'm on this. That's a topic that I'm super interested in as well. And I would love to not only talk about the transition of like what medicine looked like to you 40 years ago before you got out and then going back to it 40 years later, what, what you saw. Yeah. And yeah. then then getting into the, you know, the, the meat of this book, like what is what is going on here? What do you address in this book? Is there any connection to the first book? I think, I, I mean, I know I would love to, to know more about that. I'm sure my followers would as well. Yeah, so, let me let me uh, let me tell you. It goes on sale November 12th. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been a good ride so far. The book is a sequel to The House of God. And guess what? The fat man is back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fat man is back. We kept some characters. I love it. Yeah. What the book's about is th there used to be a hospital called Man's Best Hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for various reasons, and it was a kind of a wasp hospital, you know, the House of God was a, was a Jewish hospital. This is kind of a wasp hospital. Yeah. And what was happening to it before the book starts is because of this overarching corporation that owns it now and a lot of a lot of uh, other hospitals they uh, started to squash man's best hospital and it went down in the ratings you know the the uh, the ratings from number one to number four and uh, one of the board members even got depressed which is hard for a wasp to do you know and and so it was losing prestige and it was losing money and they had to find a way to get someone in who had prestige and money. It turns out the fat man had gone at the end of the house of God to Hollywood to do the battle run of the stars, but that wasn't big enough for him. So he went to Silicon Valley, made a fortune discovering a memory pill for Gomers and, um, Gomers. and, and us. One of your pearls. <laughs> Emory pills, right. And so they call him and they say, so he's famous and he's rich and that's what they need. So they, he, they call him and he, he said, you can do whatever you want. And what he says is, I want to start a public clinic that's just leaning up against this big hospital. And I want to round up a lot of my old, old uh, guys and stuff. And I want to show that we can put the human back in medicine, put the human back in medicine. And so he gets... Roy and Eat My Dust Eddie and Hyper Hooper and The Runt and Chuck, the main guys, and also Barry, who's now married to Roy and they have a little baby, uh, not a baby, a five-year-old. And that's what they do. They get together to try to go against all the inhumanity that's going on in medicine now, mainly money and screens. And 
I'll tell you one more thing I'll tell you. I think your viewers would want to know. At the, in the middle of the book, the fat man gives a, a lecture. Well, they don't want a lecture, but he gives a lecture, chalk on a board, <laughs> that um, he, 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 the title is The Six Rackets of American Healthcare. Follow the money. And uh, it took me two months to understand American healthcare. This book can change American healthcare. You think so? Well, I tell you, the, the one thing that this book does that the House of God could not do Mm -hmm. Audience for for the House of God was pretty much you and me, right? I mean, yeah. you know, interns go. It's about medical training. Yeah. It was really about patients. This book is about doctors and patients and nurses and hospitals. It's, but it's basically about doctors and patients because, believe it or not, when doctors are there at their uh, typewriter with their back to their patient, the patient thinks it's good for them. The patient yeah. thinks, because I've asked a lot of people, they think, oh, you're putting down my words, <laughs> you know, or, yeah. oh, they're, they're, you're trying to send things to the doctor. This, these things are, are made to make money, not for your care. And so that when patients, I think this can open all that to patients. And the thing that will change healthcare more, to a more healthy healthcare is to get an alliance, doctors, nurses who already have a union, and patients, and maybe yeah. hospitals to get together and stand up. We are the workers. We do the work. And we're burning out left and right. And that's the point. We're getting killed. Three That's doctors killed. a day kill themselves. Doctors, nurses, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And I would hope my biggest for this is that it leads to, for the first time in American history, doctors getting together. Yeah. Doctors getting together. Because that's the only way we're, we're, we have the power. Has anybody ever in a crowded theater, when somebody falls down, hear a cry go out, is there an insurance executive in the house? <laughs> no. No. Oh, true. Do the work. Yeah. So I hope, and I would be in the forefront of leading that if I could. I tell you, so is that the goal of this book? Yes. Is, is it offering solutions? Is it saying is the goal to expose the healthcare system what it is right now, and then rally all of the doctors behind it? Right. Well, that's it. The the first thing. First thing, expose. It's, it's a novel. Yeah. And the best way I found to influence people, certainly in medicine, is not by writing a paper. It's not by doing a study. A novel hits people in the heart and in the gut. Storytelling. Storytelling. And that's why 40 years later, it gets people, when POTS commit suicide, people feel it in their gut, you know, rather than statistics about suicide. So, yeah, the fat man in the book. He gives this lecture on the six rackets of healthcare. I wish, I hope we can get that phrase into the lingo. Six, the six rackets of American healthcare. The six rackets of American healthcare. Right. It's in the book. Can you explain that a little bit more. Uh, no, because it would no, it would okay. take it would take too long. It, they're all interlocked. It took me a month to figure it out. You yeah. put it this way: it goes from electronic medical records all the way to hedge funds. Uh huh. It's that kind of thing. Everything's it's all intertwined, connected. It's all inter intertwined, and people don't know that. So yeah, the first thing: what's wrong? The second thing is: how can we do something about it? And there's, it's like every other quote labor people uh, who do the work. We got to stick together. It's the yeah. thing we. Have have to do. We have to stick together. That's what that's what my hope is. Yeah. So another thing, I, I talk about this frequently with friends, the issue with the healthcare system. It's not what we thought we were signing up for. I'm spending 70% of my day charting at a computer. The system's clearly broken. I've had friends who have burned out. I've had attendings who have burned out. Nurses aren't happy. Doctors aren't happy. Rallying the troops is one thing. Do you have any ideas for an, act, an actual solution? Once we say we doctors unionize, we get the dream, we're all ready to go, we're gung-ho. Where do we go from there? What What's the actual solution? You want to know what the fat man says? Because he tells you what the solution is. The fat yep. man says in 2008, Obama created this. What he wanted it to be was this system for in, for information storage and, and, and also to spread it more easily in medicine to patients. And that was fine. That's terrific. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is the for-profit insurance companies somehow got into it and they linked the data which is great to 
payment. Ah. So what the fat man says is what we first got to do is squeeze the money out of the machines. Now, I'll tell you where I woke up to this. I was I was teaching a bunch of BU students, Boston University students here in Boston, a couple, a few years ago now. And the students who are millennials and know all about doing computers, I mean, that's not a problem for them. They hate Epic. They're telling me how much they hate Epic and how they don't get any more teaching because the interns were running to do their notes and stuff, right? You know. And so I said, well, have you, not, have you found a better computer? They thought, yeah, the VA. And then I they said, it's kind of clunky, it's old, you know, but you can write, you can type notes into it and it goes all, everywhere. You can easily go everywhere in the country on other VAs. And then I said, this woke me up, I said, well, what makes it better? And they thought for a minute, they said, there's no billing, there's no billing. If we, and in the book, at some point, I won't tell you how it happens, but the outgoing from, from the computer, which is HEAL, H-E-A-L is the name of the system. You know, uh -huh. The outgoing vanishes. Wow. So, so they have no billing. I can't even imagine a world with no ICD-10 ICD codes in, in my notes. With no billing, the fat man's team, everything gets better. You get all the information in, but you can't bill out. I mean, he arranges how to get the bills out, but not through the screen. Uh -huh. right? So as he says, it's, it's obvious, obvious. You have to get the money out of the machines, squeeze it out of the machines. I think there's a syllogism early in the book where the fat man says, money kills care, screens make money, screens kill care. Uh -huh. um, so look, it's obvious. We have to have some kind of single payer, some kind of national health insurance. Okay. That does not mean that you have to do away with private insurance. Every country, almost every country with a national system has a parallel private system if you want to get that. I, I'm on Medicare. I have supplemental private insurance. So I, you know, I have both basically. So that's not a that's not a this is look. This is going to, within five years, this is going to happen. There will be a national health care system. It's inevitable, especially if, if women get, more women get into it. Yeah. And this feels like we're about to be in the middle of a revolution. I mean, you see this stuff happening all over the place now. Really? The, the doctor burnout yeah. thing is now a viral issue. Uh, right. every, everyone is aware to of the, the charting and how much time doctors are spending behind their computer. I think more and more people are becoming discouraged from being doctors. Absolutely. Which is, I think, a first. I mean, since the 40s, have you seen anyone who was like, I, I'm scared to become a doctor because they knew what they were about to be facing? This, this is a change. Yeah, this is, this is a change. And do you know something? They did. I read a paper, a good paper. I forget where. It looked at what were the deter, what were the causes, what correlated with all of the symptoms of burnout, and only one correlated. In 2008, the introduction of the electronic medical record. Believe that? Yes, yes I do. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me at all. So, um, you know, I think what's going to happen, there will be something like Medicare for All or some other national system. I mean, the VA system wouldn't be bad, of course. And doctors at that point have to get together because we, when I talk about this, a doctor say, I can't live on Medicare. No way. And hospitals can't either, actually. So yeah. at that time, what we do as doctors, we have to get ready now, is when they start to do this and it's in Congress, we have to stick together and say, no, I can't work for that wage. You're not you're not going to have us in there unless the wages are what they are today, mostly. Yeah, that's where we have power in what looks like a disaster to some is an opportunity. But if we're just individuals, we'll never get anywhere. So hospitals, like you said, they lose money on Medicare a lot of the time. Exactly. Um, and so they, they make a lot of money from private insurance. So that's a, that's an issue. That's but, interesting. Uh, wouldn't it be great? The nurses never lose a strike. You know, the nurses have a, a union. They never lose a strike. They always win. Yeah. You know, they're women mostly. They stick together. For us to first get our group together and ally with nurses, I am going next month, I'm going to write uh, a New York York Times op-ed piece on some version of this with a nurse. I love this idea. Joining forces with the nurses who already have an established yeah. union that works. It works. 
So the nur- nurses are easy. This this thing in the Times is going to be probably the only time a doctor and a nurse have written a single op-ed piece, you know, to yeah. get. But I was putting my money where my mouth is. This is a wonderful nurse, I know. So yeah, doctors and nurses, that should be pretty easy to get on the same page because they are on the same page. And then the question is, can this is essential. Patients don't like their insurance. No, they hate their insurance. They hate their insurance mostly. They got to do all this shit too. So we have patients who will ally with us, you know, support us. And then maybe, just maybe, you get some hospitals, but we don't need the hospitals, you know. But you see what I mean? This is a classic unjust system for everyone, basically, except pharma, big pharma, and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, there's a, there's a few organizations that are, are cleaning up at other people's expense. That's right. Squeezing the money out of exactly what you said. Yeah. But um, I, I think we may be getting toward, I talk too much. I didn't let you talk enough, I don't think, did I? No, this is an interview. I want to hear what you have to say. Everyone wants to hear what you have to say. And what this book is about, let's see if we hit on all of the questions that I, I wanted to ask. It, can I hold this up? This is the look. Yeah, I see it there. And we've got a good shot of it in the background there. Yeah, okay. I have a, a, all of a sudden a wonderful doctor named uh, Baruch Kim at NYU did a, a website for me. And it's a great website. Go to it. It's, what uh, is the website called? It's uh, mansfourthbesthospital.com. Baruch is the best. That's, he told me he got connected with you. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not even surprised. He's, he's really awesome. Have you all been right, here? Have you been to it yet? This is the first time? I'm on the website right now for the first time. Okay. Well, there's great stuff there. And one terrific great stuff thing. Well, the reviews are up there. Some of the pre-publication reviews and stuff. Z-Dog MD you worked with? Z-Dog. Zubin? Z-Dog and I have become friends. What a guy. Yeah. I talk to him sometimes on Instagram. He's amazing. We're all fighting the same fight. It's terrific. You should you look at the look at what he says there. But anyway, look at there's a great JAMA film of the 40th anniversary um, of the House of God uh, panel that, came, that last uh, December of me, Barry, Chuck, Eat My Dust, Hyper Hooper, and The Run all talking about it. And it's great. It's got on that just on that thing. It's a typewriter on the on the website. I see it. It's terrific. You know what? I was listening to this in my car on the way to work today to try and do a little background. I was listening to this exact thing. Really? Yeah. About how you were writing the House of God on a single space typewriter, and there was some uh, some glass stains. I yes. love it. cigars, cigarettes. <laughs> I was kind of dissolute at that time, you know. I can't tell you how how, how thrilled I am at this, having this book out now, but also as a bookend to the House of God, really. But also getting you know people of your generation. I'm an old guy. I can sort of help maybe you find the way through this. You know what I mean? Yeah, you've seen the healthcare system develop into what it is today, which I can't even imagine being a doctor in the old in the in the forties, fifties, from what I hear. No, not forties or fifties. I'm not that old. I'm not that old. Oh, let me tell you one story before before we end, because I see the time is really going. Yeah. Um, this is the way it started, okay? What the mess we're in now with insurance, et cetera, with the money. I think it was in the 80s. I was in practice early in my psychiatric practice and managed care. Do you know that term? Yes. Um, managed care businesses just blanketed Massachusetts with information. And what they said is sort of a Nazi advice, Nazi uh, way of doing things. They said, if you don't join our managed care, you're not going to have any patients. So we doctors had a choice. Oh, you know, oh, well, we better join or no, we we are the workers. They don't, they don't have anybody except unless they have us. Yeah, right? without us, you have no patience. What you know what happened? What happened? Doctors elbowed each other out of the way to get in, and they gave over to the businessmen. That was the first thing. And that that if we had just stood up at that point all over the country, we'd be in good shape. I wonder what it is that's holding doctors back from doing that. Maybe it's fear of everything they've worked for, losing their medical degree, losing, you know, eight, 12 years of training, some, some even more. Well, you weren't going to lose it. You, well, I mean, what doctors are very good at, in general, I mean, there are exceptions, very good at focusing very carefully on medicine and doing medicine. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that hurts relationships. Yes. And, and Almost always, it hurts joining an organization that will benefit you, yes. right? So that, you know, we're, self, we're self-contained people, you know. 
That's why the nurses who are women and stick together better. That's the first law, really, of Man's Fourth Best Hospital. There are 10 laws of Man's Fourth Best Hospital at the end. The last is stick together. Stick together. Yeah, I think maybe what doctors have been missing is someone to take charge, unite the forces, and have an actual plan, a direction. I know people in my generation, our, our focus, what everyone dreams to do and aspires to do is Make an impact, change the world. If you ask anyone in my generation who is, you know, a peak performer, a highly successful person, they will all say the same thing. So I, I think maybe with that mindset and something like this, this is definitely something that's possible, hopefully in my lifetime, hopefully in yours. Well, it's up to us. Thank you so much. You're great. You can do something with others. Thank you. you. We, have the, we have the power to change healthcare. We do. Together. One, we, one, do one. we do it. <laughs> We're doing it right now. <laughs> If people want to connect with you, sign up for this book, get involved, is there anything they can, they can do right now? There's a place where you can connect, I think, on the website that Baruch made. I think the best thing you can do right now, because we haven't rolled stuff out yet, it's about almost two months still till it's published, is you can order the book on Amazon or something. You, you pre-order and you'll get it on the date of release. The, the more people who pre-order, the more Amazon sort of you know, pumps uh, your product up. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So I'm going to share a link, man's fourth best hospital in the description of this. There is a pre-order button right here. Right. So I'm going to make sure that's very clear. If you want to pre-order the book, that's where you're going to go. One Chef, thank you so much for taking your time. You're, you've been one of my heroes for a long time. Your book was given to me as an undergraduate. When I talked about my medical school aspirations, everyone's read it again. I'm, I'm honored and I'm excited to be on the team with you, you know, making this change. If there's anything you need, yeah. I'm with you. What I need is just spread the word. And, and, uh, and you know, when you actually read the book, it'll get very clear what, what's wrong and even more clear. But, you know, and stay in touch with me. You know, if you want to do another one of these things, fine. Well, at least one more when this book comes out and I get the chance to read it. So I'm okay. going to lock you in on one of those. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Thanks so much, Jay. Thank you so much. Dr. Kim, you're back. Hey, guys. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I've been a little busy reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> what page are you up to? 286. Did you change your clothes? I'm put. I, I'm putting this in the video. I love this. Uh, 286. 286. He's a very. 286. Small, small How many pages is it? I'm pretty serious about this. It's 300 and uh, what is it? It's exactly the same as the house. It's like 369 or something like it's, that. It's exactly 369. Did you do that on purpose? No, no. Uh, you know, one ver the early version was the early version was six hundred. <laughs> cut it down to about four hundred, and then I settled in at, at three three forty nine or whatever three sixty nine. It's a little less intimidating. I can I can handle three sixty nine. Three sixty nine. Yeah, it go. It's not like it's going to be a ish, uh, a hard read, right? It's a hard. It's not a hard read, is it, uh, Baruch? For me, as a as an immigrant. So it's a little. <laughs> <laughs> no, you pull that in. Hard. Say you like it. <laughs> easy read. Easy read. Immigrant friendly. Love this. <laughs> yeah. Everybody so far loves it. The the reviews. Yeah. I'm getting emails from all kinds of people. Like everybody's on Wikipedia. You know the emails that that we get, and it's amazing how people say I cry, I laugh. And this is this book is perfect. And I'm like, wow, wow, I I, I got I gotta read. <laughs> Get me a copy. <laughs> yeah, we should well, send you a copy. Uh, we don't have any more copies now, so you have to. You should come to the party. Oh, click on click on the link. Click on the link. Get it the same link. I will absolutely pre-order and share my first copy. <laughs> you should come to the party. I'm gonna do my best. Yeah, November 12th. It'll be a big, you know, thing with with just you know a lot we, of people. We're gonna have yeah, all these nice. people in one place. It's the biggest auditorium at NYU. Uh, so NY, this book is clear. I mean, NYU is the best hospital system I've seen. It's amazing. I'm, I'm so happy that I'm there. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm so I lived right next door to it last year. It's, it's an incredible facility. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, they do a great job. I'm pre-ordering your book right now. Baruch, thank you so much. Dr. Shem, keep in touch. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Let's I keep working on this. Thank you, Baruch. <laughs> hey guys. Keep, keep reading. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, bye.